领导也很平静。Thank you, and um, the, this um, title is not given by me, the myth of modern technology, but I don't mind it, whoever has assigned it. But the larger title for this uh, um, panel session is called Ecological Cataclysm and Capital's Appropriation of Modern Technology. So I might have a few reflections about that. Uh, even though I come from the city of Bhopal in, in India where I live, which had the Bhopal gas disaster in 1984. So I am also tempted to speak about that. And 3rd December is the anniversary day, and we just had the 27th anniversary. And it killed 25,000 people by now. And about uh, 250,000 people are ill still from, from that. So it's, um, it's called Bhoposhima. Um, uh, to, to talk about Hiroshima and Bhopal is similar. Uh, but what I'd like to speak is that we drew, our attention gets drawn to the problems of technology when, when a Fukushima or a Hiroshima or a Bhopal or a Chernobyl happens. And, and then the general attention goes towards the problems of, um, of technology and modern technology. But what I'd like to provocatively say is that um, the problems of technology remain uh, if, no, if no particular incidents happen. If everything is going on fine, I think there's a problem, bigger problem there. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if that only when an accident happens, then, then it's a problem of technology. When no accidents happen and things are happening as business as usual, there is a problem. And I would like to focus on, 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 on that. And, uh, a particular aspect of that is what Chandana told us. There is no problem with uh, food in, in, in Thailand in that sense. But, uh, but when you analyze it deeply, there are lots of problems. So it's not as if people are hungry and dying on the streets of uh, Bangkok. But uh, things are hap okay, but the systems are... So we just to talk about capitals, the cooperation of modern technology. Now, the first myths, there are certain myths. The new and the old technology. Now this is this is a capitals, and I would call it the capitals way of, of of appropriating our mind. What is a new technology? How do we define a new technology? Now, when we were graduate students doing physics uh, way back in early 70s, we used to have a joke in our campus, which said that if the works of three people were patented, if it was possible to patent, and I hope we never come to patent theories. We still don't. But if three people's pay, pay, uh, theories were patented, then for every human action, we would be paying 99% royalties to these three people. And all of them are 100 years and more old. So they're not new. So our, any of our actions would be paying royalty to them. And they were Newton, for obvious reasons. Anything that moves, we'll have to pay a royalty to. You take a bicycle or you take a bus ride, you have to pay a royalty to Newton because everything is determined from laws of motion he gave. To Maxwell, who gave us laws of electricity in the 18th century, in the, in the 19th century, 18, 1860s. So every time you press a switch, you have to pay $1 to Mr. Maxwell because that's how your switch works. And to Einstein, for obvious reasons. And all of these things are more than a hundred years old. So what's new about it? So we, we, we're going to pay that. I would extend that to say that perhaps the oldest technology that makes life possible is farming. And that's 10,000 years old. So can we, can we exist as, uh, as a species on Earth if we, if we don't do farming? So what's new about it? So I think uh, I could go on with these examples to say that there's nothing like a new and old technology. As J.D. Bernal, in his monumental four-volume um, book, Science and History, tried to analyze, 
what we call technology and science, as much as a part of human evolution and development as culture is. It's integral to, to human evolution. It's not something separate which is out there and we're human beings and technology is out there and we relate to it. It's part of our evolution, just as culture is, just as language is. So therefore we have to see it in that integrated human evolutionary sense and not as a standalone. Now this notion of a standalone technology to which we refer when we have problems and it will give us solution is the best form of disjunction that capital uses as a solution giver. As a solution giver and therefore something which can be given to us as a commodity and it will help us solve a problem. And this is, this is uh, the disjunction, unfortunately, which our academia uh, has propagated uh, very, very seriously as something that which is outside. So the notion of technology and science as neutral entities, they are neutral entities. It is how you use them, that you use them or abuse them. So the use and abuse model, it means technology is like a knife. And you can use a knife to, as a surgeon to, to cure your disease, or you can use it as a warrior to cut your head. So it's either violent or it is curative, depending on how to use it. The knife is neutral. This is a complete myth. Technology is part of our social, economic, political system. It is located within it, and that's how it evolves. And use and abuse is not how a surgeon or a warrior uses it, it is how it is integrated into our political economy system. <clears throat> that determines how it will get used. I think this is the first part that we have to grapple with if we want to make sense of a, a notion of use of science and technology within the system of capitalism and, and what it does to ecology. I could use a parallel example with land. With land and agriculture, we are familiar with a social system which we call um, landlordism, relations of land, production. So we have a system of who owns the land, who rents it, who is the labor on it, what is the sharing between the labor and the owner, what is given to the consumer. So it's a system of rents, uh, sharing, and labor which we call the land system. <coughs> Pay a little bit of attention, and we never do this in our universities, and I don't know why. All of us sitting in this room, unfortunately, and I'm being very provocative, are the same bonded laborers as we had on land, a system of bonded laborers and slaves on land. We are all part of those bonded laborers in the system of information technology. If we had landlordism, we have cyberlordism. There is a broadband owning company or a television company which has a right to give us a license to a buyer to which we pay a rent, a fees every month so that the channels come to us or a broadband fees by which we get our internet. And we have a hardware provider who uses that little gadget we put in right in front of me here, uh, which catches that signal. And if you see the relationship between this and the land, it's, it's in parallel. There's a wonderful paper which actually compares the two systems uh, between land holding and between information technology holding. And we are the suckers. Very politically aware people we are the ones who are bonded to it in this relationship because we pay the fees, we pay the rents. And, and how does it appropriate us? By one Mr. Bill Gates and his Microsoft giving us windows and every morning we say, Namaste windows. <laughs> and every time we touch the screen, we pay a dollar and a cent to Mr. Bill Gates for everything it does. But then Mr. Bill Gates says, oh, I've given them the software, um, Windows 95, 
but they all have it in their computer. So what do I produce now? So he has to say, now Windows 95 will be now Windows XP because it got enhanced features. And suddenly all of us say, hey, did you get XP? No, I haven't. Oh, you must get XP. But why? I don't know why. <laughs> no one knows why. And we're like the slaves on that, uh, 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 on the land because we're completely uncritical to know. Most of us don't even use 25% of Windows 95 power. Because all we do is do typing and write some papers and do some email. You're not using even 25% of that. And when you shift to XP, you're not even using 10% of that. But you're hooked on to it. Oh, she's got it already, but I haven't got it. Oh, it's got a new look. Oh, its, it's menus are very fancy. What the hell do you do, do you record those menus for? If you're writing a bad paper anyway. <laughs> so, um, but but, but we, we, we must get on. That's the way capital plays on us. The most classic example of that is the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, I mean, this is a documented case. Now, diabetes is a disease, which is a metabolic disease. That there is the, 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 the pancreas is not able to produce insulin or we have insulin resistance. So sugar buildup happens, which can have consequences on, on all our body. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly um, dangerous disease to have. Now what do the drug companies do? So the drug companies love disease because profit can't come unless you have disease. So first of all, they're very happy that they have a new challenge. So I'll give you a new solution, modern solution. The modern solution for most of these diseases today is not to cure them. Because if you cure them, then you don't need the drug again. So it's bad for profits. So what, what is a good drug in, in, in the capitalist system? It's a drug that controls, not cure. Because when, when once it controls, then you need to take it all the time. So that it remains controlled. But if it cures you, then you take it for three months and then you don't need the drug. So therefore the drug company cannot sell it anymore to you. And believe me, and this might sound kind of surreal, drug companies know this, so they don't invest in research for cure drugs. And in diabetes, there was a case with uh, GlaxoSmithKline, where two of their researchers actually were on the threshold of getting a, a, a cure drug for diabetes, and they pulled off money to that research. They, 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 they pulled the socket saying that we don't want this research anymore. And the two guys were without their research funding because they could take away their profits. And this you can see across the board, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, in, in ICTs, in, in software industries, that you need to replace. And then, of course, you use the, the classic systems of the capital system to say, oh, you have an old computer, but I have a new one in the market. So how do you make that guy give up that old one so that the new one can go in? Or will you exchange? So you exchange your old one with a new one and we'll give you a discount. So that you replace that with, with a new one. Now, I, when, I, when I use this metaphor for a couple of days, this work across most of this. Now, it is these new systems of selling and buying which are new. There's nothing new about the technologies. It is these systems of, of trying to uh, uh, penetrate through those markets. But many of the silicon technology which, which whatever this uses is hardly new. There's nothing new about the silicon technology. But it will be packaged in a way as if to say that this is very new. Now, this is why I'm saying that these are not things that are blowing up like Fukushima or Chernobyl. This but these are, these are the blow-ups which are happening all the time, silently, to which we, we become, part, as I said, suckers to it, and, and we, are, we are getting to it, in, indebted to it. The question is that, we all talk about problems, so, this, so, so, so technology works in this, these ways. The point is that I was trying to say that other time, we do have alternatives. The, the important thing about technology and its uh, um, penetration in society and its location within political economic systems is that the good thing about technology is that there are technologies 
It's not technology. You're not stuck with one. There is more than one. Question is, what decision-making system decide which technology to use or not? The anti-land movement that Chandana referred to is basically a technology for centralized water reservoirs. You use a big dam, you trap water in a very big reservoir, and then you distribute it. So that's, that's a technology of water uh, uh, trapping and, and management. You have technologies of decentralized water trapping and decentralized water using. You can have the same amount of water trapped in smaller little reservoirs and used in a very decentralized way uh, with local control rather than a centralized control. But capital does not want small systems because the profits and margins are very low. The profit margins are very high in a very centralized system. So the capital will use the technology of the larger reservoir rather than smaller reservoirs. Now his question is, do we have a social system or a political system which says, no, we prefer the smaller system because there is less displacement, there is less impact on, on uh, large tracts of land, and there can be uh, community control on smaller systems. You can use the skills of the local artisans you don't require to get uh, skills outside. So there's a whole system which goes between these two choices. The, the, to me, the important point about is these choices. For example, for all of us sitting here, we have a choice today between saying namaste to Microsoft and Windows and using open software systems where, which, which are non-proprietary, where there are no fees being paid, where there's no monopoly. Microsoft is a monopoly. But Ubuntu or Linux are open systems, which are democratic systems. You and I can get the source code, we can intervene in them, we can improve them. It is not mediated by capital. So the problem is that we are not taught, read, aware that we have that choice, a democratic choice to participate in a technical uh, situation with all our laptops and notebooks, where we can be part of a democratic system of software which doesn't have uh, the capitalization costs. And what, why, why does that happen? Because our university never teaches that. Why don't they teach us that? Because Microsoft is get, giving sponsorships to universities to do courses. It is. It is, it is they're giving free computer trainings to school children in India and most of South now. Why? Because it's very well known that children are get addicted to Coca-Cola and chocolates. You also get addicted to the software, first software that you use. If you start using Windows from the beginning, then shifting to Ubuntu 10 years later is more or less impossible. You're always insecure. Oh, I don't know how to use that. I'd rather stick to that. They know that. So they get children hooked onto it now so that the children can be on Windows for the rest of the life. So you, you, but there is no sponsor for open software because that doesn't use advertisements. So they're not coming to schools and saying, we'll give it to you free and we'll hook on to you. But who can be the agents for that? You and me. We don't require a company to come and do that. You and I can c come and say, we want our children to be on open software from, from the first time they, they use a computer. Now, what I'm trying to say is that there are, move, there are resistance movements to it. We heard about the biotype, which is a resistance movement, which engages. There are resistance movements to any of them. I have a last point to make, which is new technologies then become also panacea in situations where we have problems in deciding what to do. And I will use the last example I would want to use is climate change. We know climate change is a problem because of the cumulative increase of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a solution that cuts them. So Durban, you don't want to cut them because the countries want to compete for economic reasons. Now, the more we quarrel at Durban's and Cancun's and Copenhagen's, the more we are pushing ourselves into technical solutions, not social and political solutions. So social and political solutions are the emission cuts. You don't go beyond 1.5 degree or 2 degree at best. But the moment we don't, what are we strengthening? We are strengthening bioengineering technologies. And the bioengineering technologies is to be the shadow behind Durban, which is never in front. And these are companies which say that you don't require political solutions, you don't require cuts. You know, we'll seed the atmosphere 
with metals and those metals will absorb carbon dioxide. We will have reflectors which will cool uh, the atmosphere. So we will find technical, technical solutions to, to global warming. So why are you bothered about saying let's, let's change our uh, cars and reduce and number of cars and so on. Have your cars. We will find technical solutions to do that. In any way you can't find political solutions because you are ideologically minded. Now it is these kind of politics which plays out in Durban and Copenhagen. And it is the kind of politics which our governments are aware or unaware and therefore do, do not see where they are leading themselves into. What they would probably, the government would do, say, okay, you have a technology, give it to us cheap. Find a fund to give us that technology. Without questioning that that technology might have 50 other side effects which are going to destroy this earth maybe faster. Which is what happens with every drug that we, we take. We then never know the side effects. Five years later when we have the side effect, then we say, oh, this drug doesn't work anymore. So let's try a new drug. So uh, this bioengineering is to me the, the victor from the failures of cops. And these bioengineering methods, to me as a technical person, are not on. They're not going to be working. They have too many unknown questions of, of dangers to, to the entire planet. But, but this is our inability to find political solutions which then pushes you into so-called new technologies. So what I would probably therefore say is that it's not enough for us to say that, oh, I'm a social scientist, so I don't understand technology. If it is a technology that is affecting my life, then at least as uh, people who are informed, and this is my sales pitch, we all need to become people scientists, no matter whether we're doing history or sociology or whatever. If we don't do that, we're leaving it in the hands of people who are going to sell it and push it down our throats anyway. Thank you. Should we, should we stop here for a coffee break? I'm fine. <laughs> 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 all, all for a coffee break, I'm fine. But anyway, uh, I'll try to make it as fast as possible. At one point, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking of passing on you know, presentation because, well, we have two giants here. Uh, to <laughs> ecological activists and thinkers here, and I, well, I feel so humble that I need to, to say. But, but Kinchi pressed me to speak on something, so I'm standing on the shoulders of these two giants. I want to, to do a humble job by, you know, presenting some uh, supplementary information on this. I will try to go swift through it. So my topic is a uh, critical uh, economic uh, reason applied to ecology, and I have a, a basic question to to ponder on. What madness is driving us to squeeze our planet to the last drop? And what madness... Oh, sorry. And what madness make us blind to a uh, blunt fact about our, our, our situation? I want to find the root of that madness. So this is uh, my question. So, so let me take into the case of the global warming or climate change problem. You know, in the, uh, during the uh, 90s, the industry in America, in America, one of those uh, long Jakarta campaign, they spend a billion US dollar to try to you know discredit the the, or the global warming uh, phenomenon. So one of this is the graph they use mostly is about you know a contribution of the so-called greenhouse effect. You know uh, actually other greenhouse so-called greenhouse effect is not so important as the water vapor. So based on this graph. They, they will conclude that, wow, actually, well, there's no anthrogenic uh, gen, uh, uh, effect on global warming. So this is their argument. But based on, exactly based on this graph, we know that this is the other picture. Exactly based on this, this graph that we know that, wow, the real cause of global warming is man-made. So let me go into it. So what's the cycle? I think the most important uh, one of the, uh, you know, global system is a lot of cycles. Ecological thought is always about cycle, a complete cycle. And one of the most important cycle, ecological cycle in on Earth is water cycle. You know, a healthy uh, cycle, especially water cycle, is the key to for the climatic uh, uh, regulation at the global level. So, if we keep keep a, a healthy vegetation system, especially a uh, primitive uh, forest with good, uh, healthy biodiversity. 
You know, water, water is, water is one of the most uh, miraculous uh, material in the world, I mean in the universe. Without water, there's no life. So when, whenever we look for a uh, life form in other planets, first of all, we look for, we're looking for water. Because water has the highest heat capacity in the universe. That makes, well, uh, water is so essential to life. So, with a good uh, vegetation system, with a good, especially a forest system, a lot, a huge amount of heat is, in the sun, in the sand, a storage within this uh, 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 water and vegetation cycle. So, if you destroy the forest, if you just let the water uh, run off of the ground, then a lot, a huge amount of heat will release into the atmosphere. And to me, I believe. Of course, because I'm a scientist, I based on this document. This document is maybe one of the most important documents uh, in, human, in human history. I urge everyone to uh, read uh, this document. It's a very short paper. It's prepared by a, so, so a group of uh, Slovenian uh, scientists it's to explain the importance of the water cycle in the, in the climate change. So, the idea is evapotranspiration transpiration is essential to the, to the, the global clim uh, climatic uh, regulation. So, it's estimated that if water is not sufficiently present in the land, a large part of the in incidental solar energy is charged in the sense of heat, and the temperature of the environment is sharply wise. This is the real reason, to me, it's the real reason behind global warming. Why that there's the other greenhouse gas, CO2, something like that? So. The calculation like that, every year, the, the, you know, uh, the loss of the good vegetation uh, system <coughs> by the, of course, deforestation and urbanization, each year amounts to the annual global production of electric, uh, electric, electrical energy. A huge amount of energy is released into that atmosphere because of this, uh, this the destruction of the vegetation system, most importantly, the, the the, the, the forest and our design of our city is fatal <coughs> because the design of any modern city will cause water run out. We just try to connect water into the sewer system and let them just run out into the uh, the ocean. That's stupid. So that's why all cities <coughs> will become a kind of hot place. This is mainly reason for global warming. So why I love this approach? Well, I am not a scientist. So I will use the fashion way. Why I love this approach is if we follow the so-called CO2 discussion, we will become a not doomsday scenario. You know, if you follow, if we follow the argument, they have they have the argument that even if we stop the emission of greenhouse effects, uh, greenhouse gas into the atmosphere, the the, the temperature will go, will keep rising for at least 1.2 degree. So this is a doom doomsday scenario. That's make uh, the stupid guy like uh, Love Law. One I, I respect him once, but now he's such a stupid guy. He always said, "Well, this is the we are the end. Enjoy what you have got to do. We have a, a doomsday. It is a low return. That is a fatalist discussion. If we follow the so-called CO two discussion, but if we follow the this uh, water cycle, then I'm totally optimistic because we have a way to revert the the the, the, the global warming." By very simple, just renew natural forests on about seven percent of cultivated land is enough to offset all our man-made or anthro and anthropogenic genetic carbon emissions. So that makes uh, me so optimistic. Optimistic. So that's why water and the carbon cycle. Oh, well, I just go for it. I'm not saying that well. CO2 or carbon cycle is not important. We should stop, you know, uh, uh, depending on the, 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 the oil, and the, we should keep the oil on, on, on the ground. But I, I, will, I, I, I will advocate, you know, uh, that's carbon reduction on another reason because of the acidification of the ocean. Is another reason, very important reason, no less important, no less uh, important reason than the than the global warming. But to me, water cycle is more important. So. If you look at the parallel uh, movements in the last two centuries, this is deforestation during after the uh, industrial revolution that really can lead to the global warming phenomenon. So that's a very important process. Or I, I don't have time to go into it. So, so I think the solution is very simple: stop the monkey show, of the climate summit, and stop the bullshit of carbon trade. It's simple. 
forests and water cycle is the key to radical, the, uh, the climate change. And CO2 is big because it fits with the economic reasoning. I mean, not only CO2, but all greenhouse effects and can serve as a new candidate for financial explanation. So I will, but more importantly, we should make it mandatory for the population living in the environmental <coughs> region to cut, including Hong Kong and, and most of uh, where, where you're living, cut our material and energy consumption level by at least part percent. Oh, let me go through it. But why? Why we choose this one? Because you know, if that's, because greenhouse gas could be quantified into tradable unit. That's the reason. We could not quantify biodiversity. We could not trade biodiversity. That's the why. Because what well, now we have one ton, two ton of this uh, greenhouse gas that we can trade it. That's the reason behind why suddenly they, they jump into the in this so-called global warming discourse. So a lot of money in time. So I will go through it. Uh, uh, the market is making some well. I think uh, Patrick will have a lot. He is the expert on it, so I, I won't go through it. And of course, they have built up uh, 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 economics uh, uh, of uh, this carbon trade. Ridiculous things, well, I won't go into it, details. And of course, and so this is the global warming. Some bit of technology. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, we all know that the, the, the trade mark, the, the carbon market is stupid because, well, I'm not a reason. And most importantly, actually, it will do the refer, have the worst uh, uh, effect. Local polluters actually receive profits from offset credits. They, they are by land, so they are subsidized to destroy by original community with biodiversity. Because the, okay, because the local uh, uh, community does, could not afford the expensive uh, carbon auditing. So that makes these big local you know, West features Actually, they can benefit from this uh, whole, whole mechanism. I think it's stupid. So, now I want to ask why. Why they go for it? Of course, because it's a capitalism. For me, capitalism is a form of madness. So I, I love this argument. Every argument about capitalism is rational, except capitalism itself. So capitalism is a form of delirium. So from this that madness, we have another uh, imperative madness. It's a goal, la poisson et d'une folie. Growth is a madness, so I will go through it. Of course, and of course, finally, we have some, you know, uh, the notorious uh, uh, Laurie Summers, you know, the guy, the key person of the neoliberal uh, uh, regime, who in uh, in the nineties, the nineties, asked you for for I will I will I will term it the ecological imperialism. He argued that actually. The eco economic logic behind dumping a, long, a load of toxic waste into the lowest wage country is impeccable. And actually, the, he, think that, he thinks that these countries are under -polluted. They are not economic, economically efficient enough to be polluted. So they should be more polluted in order to do. To, to, to. So I touch upon uh, the issue in my another essay <coughs> in, in my emerging center in, uh, uh, country uh, introduction. If you have interesting, well, if you have interest, well, you may take a look. So we can try to uh, actually scan this economic uh, economic reasoning one point by point. But I, for me, it's simple. I will just pick up one point. Is it is that since 1987, we are entering into a new historicity. What I call a new historicity is that we are in a age of ecological oversuit. That make all these eco economists bullshit. I'm not arguing, well, maybe, uh, maybe Adam Smith was right, maybe Keynes or uh, Keynes was right, maybe Schumpeter was right. But after 1987, they are all wrong. They are bullshitting. And that's simple. I don't want to go into that argument. So maybe you are, you know, uh, more enough about uh, ecological oversuit, so I won't go through it. I'm sorry because, well, so for me, now we're in a mode of ecological overshoot. Now the earth is too, that makes most of our old good economic wisdom obsolete. Now the earth is too small and too clouded to allow us to be competitive. Our invaluable natural resources are too limited to afford creative destruction. The old paradigm of power for the previous competition is not only obsolete, but instrumental to humanity. So another no-brainer, <laughs> well, we, go, we, we won't go for it. That's mass 
well, how the economists know so little about ecological system? Because eco all ecological system is complex adaptive uh, system. I will explain on this uh, in my conclusion. So now I will try to work based on some uh, simple uh, ecological philosophy. And for me, the most important of, of ecological thinking is the, the regenerative cycle. You know, in, in ecological uh, cycle, there's no such a thing as waste. Everything will return into this cycle and regenerate again. And this is what the uh, 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 ecological cycle is functioning. And I think we should model our economies based on this ecological model, and especially within the uh, ecological uh, limit. So the problem now, since the, 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 the 14th century, we have the exploitative capitalism. We have a disrupt cycle. Now, from Europe, they will take resources from other part of the world. Then they do dump races in another part of the world. Place of the world. That's the problem. That's why it makes exploitative capitalism is harmful to the hum humanity. Ten years ago, I read a, a, a paper from Professor Muto. I learned a lot from, from him because in, uh, in the ancient East, in Japan and China, we have huge uh, cities with population nearly up to a million. But never in uh, the East, in China and Japan, we have any trade. China, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, this is my conclusion. We, we have a lot of trade in, in the European history. Because why? Because in, 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 in China and Japan, we try to recirculate everything even the human inscription, inscription. But in Europe, they try to connect the human inscription and try to move uh, out away of the city and dump in the uh, surrounding city. That is the reason of prayer. So that's why prayers are such a prevalent phenomenon, a historical uh, uh, phenomenon in, in, in European history. But it never has been in, in, in China or in Japan. Or in, in, why? Because we have the complete circle. So, okay, let's jump to the uh, conclusion. So I want to uh, quite a bit philosophical. I want to trace the, the, the root of this uh, uh, madness. And to me, as far, the farthest I, I can trust is from Plato. And I think from Plato to Marx, I'm sorry, <laughs> Remy, from Plato to Marx, they share a common meta metaphysical bias. You know, from Plato onward, they look at the, the world as just a stock of materials. So suddenly we have the idea, we can be have the intelligence. So is it? So is a result of we have the form. The world is just a passive, formless master waiting for us to give them a form, to give them a, 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 a value. So that's why mass for them, for him, production is more important because it's a value create, creating process. And of course we have this uh, patriarchy. Man is man who conceived the, the woman. So, you see, all these Western Eurocentric uh, ideas share some metaphysical bias. Is that only man has intelligence, only man has agency, and the nature is just material, it's passive. So, my idea is we have to, we spend a very important thing is ecological system itself has a higher intelligence, and human intelligence is support, subordinate to it. If we, by denying intelligence to the ecological system, we are fooling ourselves, making ourselves idiots. I think this is the root of all the mayhem we, we, we have. So I will uh, incorporate, well, I don't have time. If you have interest, just uh, please read my 1,000 words and, and my, my, my essays on the E7. So, I mean, the, the, the central task for we imagining society today is to develop a quality management of the commonwealth we share. And, well, I don't have time to go into this definition. How e uh, ecological system is a complex adaptive system. So if you're interesting, we are we can talk about it. So my idea is, well, now we have two paradigms of civilization. One is the old obsolete suicidal one, well, always represented by the capitalism. Another one is the well, we are always looking for new, this new paradigm, new idea. So I thought I think it's fine enough. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, it's time off, but um, is there any question? One, two. Okay, two. 
And I'm surprised you don't know about that. And I mean, in recently in Paris twice now already, there was a meetings of the Eco-Socialist Manifesto with Michel Loy, you, so, and, and others. So it's, a, it's very important. But of course, it's not enough, because it has to be an eco-socialist feminist analysis. <laughs> for obvious reasons, which explains about the treatment of matter and body and so forth. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay, so, so, so yeah, I mean, <clears throat> combining them is important, and, and, and in Brazil, there is a socialist movement that Matt Lowy and, and many other people, Bellamy Foster has been, has been trying to write so much about, about this, and, and therefore, I mean, there are movements around which Basis, and I do agree that we need to do that. And, uh, uh, except that there are various, there are works in progress. Most of them are works in progress. I, I talked in the morning about uh, how we're very, very um, in diff great difficulty, intellectual difficulty, trying to combine Gandhi and Marx. Uh, very, very difficult. In fact, we had, a, we had a project here of Gandhi, Mao, and Marx. Gandhi, Mao, and Marx, and how to take elements from them towards a new uh, paradigm, uh, which would be based in ecology. So, so there are attempts of this kind. Uh, and I think um, in, in, as a result of the sustainability forum, we should see how we can strengthen these, both in theory and practice. So that, that's the, the question that you asked earlier. About, about your, the specific question, well, this is in some sense a, a, a victory for the commons because the commons, uh, particularly the commons in, in, in uh, computer software, is posing a threat to, to the monopoly. It is posing a threat to the monopoly and in fact Microsoft realizes and Google realizes that uh, the free software community is no longer a small community. I will give you a little example. When we did the Mumbai forum, in 2004, we took two decisions. One decision was that in the whole forum, there will be no Coca-Cola. So we would not allow Coca-Cola inside the forum. It would be replaced by local fruit drinks, which are so common in India. So local entrepreneurs who make uh, fruit-based drinks, they would get uh, uh, space, but not Coca-Cola. The second was more difficult. We had 3,200 journalists in, in the Mumbai Forum. And we decided that there would be no Microsoft in the, in, the, in the Mumbai Forum. And the journalist said, hey, you're not doing Microsoft, then how can we come and cover? We said, our volunteers will be there to convert every computer into free software, and they will be standing if you have a problem 24 hours. We had 3,200 journalists, and we had everyone there with no Microsoft in the, in the forum. We kept Microsoft out of the Mumbai forum. And Microsoft actually came to us and said, protested. They said, how could you do this? We, said, well, we have a choice. We have a choice. So I'm saying that this is challenging them. Now, they're being smart. This is a long story. They are trying to break the free software community by saying that, no, it should not be free. This should be licensed, but not monopoly licensed. So you pay a rent, but you don't have a monopoly. And they say, we are prepared to share some codes, but not all the codes. But this to me is a victory for the, for the commons, for the non-monopolistic commons in software. So they attend conferences, because there are now big, big systems, offices, which are using free software and not using proprietary software. So it's hitting them. So they're coming and saying, oh, it can't be free, but pay a fee. OK, it won't be copyrighted license, but it can be a fee. Like, to change the terms of rent. So I think, I think uh, this is one area where we can say that it's an impact being made by, by common. It depends on how much of our leaders in the free software community are, will, will compromise with them or not compromise. So, so I, I, I think that's that's why they are there in these conferences. Okay, I uh, reply quickly. Um, I think the solidarity between the urban consumers and the rural farmers was 
あデファリトリーだイナリアリティビフォーダニュクリアアクシデントビコーザージャパニーズオーバイファーマーザースタッフィットゼアファーミングインデナイティセブンティーズアンダーメニーダーアーバンコンシューマーズアンダービルドアパートラーアーパートラーシップウィザーファーマーズアンダーアーバンコンシューマーズゼイフィルコアンサンタンザザゼイディズノットゲットアーウィッチゼイウォントゲットビコーザーザースーパーマーケットはザ・モア・コンビニエントだ、パッテリシングだ、アーフロータ、オーガニックファーマー、オーガニックファーマーだ、センターボックス、アンダー、ウィフルオープン、ベジタブルズ、バットディフだ、コンシューマーズにだ、キャロット、ザ・オーガニックファーマーディフノットネセサリー、センター、キャロット、バット、ザ・コンシューマーズディフノットコンプレイン、ビコスゼイリフレクトオンダーゼア、アーバン、コンビニエント、アンダー、アーフューエント、ライス。And this kind of the community uh, uh, supported agriculture uh, was in crisis as I told. But hopefully,、um, I would like to the,、um, the, uh, improve this situation. And、uh, now, the urban consumers were very concerned about the radioactive contamination. So they don't want to eat、uh, food polluted by the radiation.、Uh, also, farmers want the consumers to eat their product. But the, So, the situation is now very difficult, but some hope, I think.、Um, two months ago, I went to the Fukushima、uh, to visit、uh, the local、uh, farmers, and several the students, university students, w a s with me, and they were the,、uh, saying that they wanted to know、uh, what are going on in the local、uh, rural areas. So, they had、uh, some reflection of the Their affluent and convenient life in the、uh, Japanese society. So I hope this must be the improving the,、uh, the current、uh, relationship between the farmers and the consumers. Okay, thank you very much. And、um, uh, we are sorry for、uh, one hour of time, and then this is now the another section intellectuals and the tradition of popular、uh, And the chair will be、uh, recycled. Thank you. Uh,